Howdy y'all, welcome back. Thank you so much for being here. We have an incredible video today. A centerpiece for intercontinental relations, what some refer to as the Wonderland on the French and German border. This city not only serves as one of four de facto capitals of the European Union, but it also is the seat of the European Parliament. The entire historic center of this city, known as Grand Island, has been a UNESCO World Heritage Site since 1988, and that is the same year that this wonderful urban center celebrated its 2000th anniversary. Today, we will be looking at the first and the oldest photographs of Strasbourg, France, dated from 1848 through 1928. The city of Strasbourg houses over 290,000 inhabitants inside the city proper, with the greater Strasbourg area being home to nearly 515,000 people, and the larger Strasbourg metropolitan area has a population of over 860,000, making it the eighth largest metro in France, according to modern statistics. However, numbers don't appear to do this ancient city justice, as the remarkable architecture we see in the oldest photographs of Strasbourg truly indicates just how deliberately orchestrated and refined, how meticulously unified the architecture in this city once was. Another interesting tidbit is that Strasbourg is one of only five cities in the world to house an international first order organization while not being a state capital. The others are Basel, Geneva, The Hague, and New York City. Strasbourg also has some of the largest and earliest religious structures in all of France and is home to the largest mosque in France, the Grand Mosque of Strasbourg. As we dive into this collection of the first photographs ever taken of Strasbourg, let us now see what the current narrative has to say regarding this masterclass of culture, while reminding ourselves to take everything we read and hear today with a grain of salt. To preface this, we have a unique exploration in today's video of over 160 of the oldest, most detailed photographs of Strasbourg that I could come across, pulling from sources like internet archives, forums on architecture, private collections, museums, as well as images I had found throughout my last few years of research. What I was able to compile for you today is nothing less than astounding. We will have images dated as early as the year 1848 which already appear to showcase a very sprawling city with impressive and towering architecture, all crafted along the water side. By the year 1870, we have severe damage to a lot of the ancient structures in Strasbourg that occurred during a major conflict between France and Germany, or more specifically, between France and Prussia. And yet, we have photographs in this video from the end of the 19th century as well, and they show Strasbourg as thriving once again. So how was all of this achieved? Honestly, the current narrative is brief at best, yet it is chocked full of all of these odd details. So let us get right into it. Strasbourg has been occupied since the Neolithic or New Stone Age, as attested to by multiple artifacts dug up through early excavations. The first confirmed occupation of the land, again, according to the modern scholars, was by proto-Celtic people around the year 1300 BC. Roughly 1,000 years later, Strasbourg was known to the Celtic people as Argentorate and served as a major hub of trade. The Celtic people built elevated houses, known as stilt houses, situated over the river. However, major Roman drainage systems then converted these stilt houses into homes built over dry land. Houses to be built up and survive rising mud. It's all very interesting. The Romans then renamed, or rather Latinized the name further, calling the city Argentoratum also commonly known as Argentina in medieval Latin. The Roman city, which housed large encampments of soldiers, was destroyed and rebuilt at least six times in the years 70 AD, 97 AD, 235 AD, 355 AD, roughly around 380 AD, and again in roughly 420 AD. 
It was after the siege and destruction of 70 AD that the Roman Emperor Trajan ordered major construction projects in the city that would eventually become Strasbourg, giving the city much of the shape that it retains today. Strasbourg was then in the subsequent years occupied by the Alemanni, the Huns, and the Franks, and by the 9th century, it served as the center for the trilingual oaths of Strasbourg, written in Latin, Old High German, and the first documented account in history written in Gallo-Romance, or the earliest form of clearly distinct French. The oaths of Strasbourg are considered as marking the birth of two countries, France and Germany. Strasbourg came under the control of the Holy Roman Empire by the year 923, yet after centuries of rebellions by the citizens, it was granted the status of free imperial city, becoming the imperial city of Strasbourg in 1262. By the year 1333, Strasbourg came under heavy influence by the guilds and was known as a free republic. However, the bubonic plague of 1348 ravaged the city, leading to some radical policy changes that would forever reshape the landscape of Strasbourg. In the year 1349, the Jewish population of Strasbourg faced further hardships. They were being ostracized and banned from the city after 10 p.m. every night. This would be declared by the blowing of the historic Gruselhorn. Furthermore, there were heavy taxes that were levied upon them, and this led to a fracturing of most of the guilds in the city of Strasbourg, and the population of Strasbourg began to decline. However, Strasbourg then soon did achieve a golden age. In 1439, the Strasbourg Cathedral was completed, marking the first time in history that a building had surpassed the height of the Great Pyramid of Giza. The Strasbourg Cathedral was the tallest building in the entire world at that time, and just a few years after the cathedral's completion, Johannes Gutenberg created the first European movable type printing press in Strasbourg, an invention that would also reshape the course of history. Marking the strange course of history in Strasbourg, somewhat paranormally, Strasbourg was the site for the Dancing Plague of 1518, where over 400 residents of Strasbourg essentially danced or violently moved their bodies in a ritualistic way without sleep for up to multiple weeks. It was called at the time a dancing mania thought to be brought on by pure evil. Of the over 400 people in Strasbourg that were afflicted, it is thought that every single one of them passed, either from heat stroke, exhaustion, or starvation. Essentially, this played a major role in bringing the teachings and treaties of Martin Luther to fruition, as the following year, 1519, gave rise to his ideals in Strasbourg. By 1605, the first modern newspaper in the world was created in Strasbourg. The free city of Strasbourg remained neutral during the Thirty Years' War from 1618 through 1648, but was later annexed by Louis XIV of France. At the time, it was believed only 1% of the population of Strasbourg actually spoke French. When the news of the storming of the Bastille occurred in 1789, the city hall of Strasbourg, the heart of the city, was also sacked. By 1793, the mayor of Strasbourg was captured and met the guillotine. Strasbourg's status as a free city was then revoked. During the French Revolution, it was discussed heavily about tearing down the massive spire of the Strasbourg Cathedral as the ultimate insult to injury. However, 
calmer minds prevailed, and instead, a giant Phrygian cap was created and placed upon the top of the spire, which could be seen for dozens of miles in every direction. This massive Phrygian cap was one of the most exquisite artifacts in Strasbourg, but was later destroyed along with much of the city during the 1870 Franco-Prussian War. Under Napoleon, who stayed in the city for many years in the early 1800s, the population of Strasbourg more than tripled to over 150,000 people. However, all the massive growth of Strasbourg, as well as the history and the districts of Strasbourg, most of it was destroyed in August and September of 1870 during the Great Siege of Strasbourg, a conflict of the Franco-Prussian War. At the end of the siege, over 10,000 inhabitants of the city were left without shelter, and hundreds of ancient and remarkable buildings were left in ruins. With the end of the war and the 1871 Treaty of Frankfurt, Strasbourg was transferred to the newly established German Empire. During this time, we're told the massive belt of fortifications, formations around the city, most of which survived World War I and World War II and still stand today, these were created much in the same light as the much earlier star forts. The photographs we see today are some of the only examples in existence we have showcasing the architecture of Strasbourg before, during, and directly after the siege of 1870. So that is why I felt like sharing these photographs with you today was very important. Stick around because we have over 100 more unique and most likely never before seen, at least not in our time, photographs to look at today. If you enjoy this content, please subscribe. I have a lot more videos showcasing thousands of old photographs, photographs from before the year 1900. So if you enjoy this content, definitely stick around for more of that. As always, I thank you so much for being here. I can't wait to hear your comments and your opinions about Strasbourg down below. And I will talk to you all very soon on the next video.
To me, the remarkable thing that stands out about these photographs, especially these specific photographs that we're looking at right now, taken the days directly after the siege of 1870, is that we see destruction upon the city. We see destruction upon these structures that at their base layer, they are built out of red brick. Now we've discussed it before, if there is or is not some sort of unification between these cultures that are using the red brick, but that's neither here nor there. What we see is ancient architecture being destroyed. And this is not just specific to this one location. As one of my favorite quotes goes, war never changes. And it's the same thing here. But throughout the mid 1800s, we have so many different conflicts that are framed under the auspices of using this new military strategy of the industrial age, which involved basically tearing down all of the old architecture with the new weaponry. And we're led to believe that this was all done under the idea of conquering and freedom and things of that nature. But what it really looks like is an entire deconstruction of a past civilization, a past culture, a past aspect of society that they no longer wanted us to have access to. So I'm just going to leave it at that. I thank you again so much for being here. Let me hear your comments down below, and I can't wait to talk to you on that next video. Cheers, y'all.